All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. It's Thursday, and that means it's basically Friday, and I'm happy about that. I, I am happy about that. I'm looking forward to the weekend. Let's all just pretend that tomorrow doesn't actually exist and just look forward to the weekend. Let's look forward to the weekend. Today, we are going to continue talking about threads. Uh, I would like to finish our discussion on critical sections and locks, and then we're going to move into talking about deadlock. Deadlock, as its name implies, kind of is related to the use of locks in threaded and concurrent code. Uh, we're also going to talk about the term test, but I want to get through the critical section stuff first before I talk about the term test. The term test stuff is put snugly in the middle of the two topics that we're going to be talking about today, and then we'll move on to, to taking a look at deadlock after that. So by the end of today's lecture, what I'm hoping that you are able to do is uh, continuing. I want you to be able to identify the critical sections requiring mutually exclusive access to a piece of code that will be run concurrently using threads, period, period. So I don't care about processes right now, just threads. I want you to be able to continue to identify correct and incorrect implementations that attempt to protect a critical section. In class, again, this is related to the placement of lock acquisition and the placement of our lock. So where does our lock object go? And then where do we actually acquire and release the lock? That's the correct implementation that I'm looking for here. The other half of this is uh, you're going to be doing this in the lab next week. Um, this is where you're going to be implementing a lock. So we're talking about the correct use of locks. Next week, you will be implementing a lock. And this is in, that, uh, in the textbook chapter where we're talking about things like ticket locking and um, atomic operations and atomic uh, modifications to things to uh, implement locks, check, check and test and set, uh, those kinds of operations. And the other thing that we're going to be beginning to do today and then hopefully finishing, but it's okay if we don't finish it, I want to be able to identify a piece of co identify code that's protecting a critical section that could result in deadlock. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this from a W to a C that could result in deadlock and then propose solutions that avoid and or prevent said deadlock. I'm going to say this now, and I'm going to say it again when we get to deadlock, and I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to try to say it again even after that. Deadlock is a situation that can happen. We cannot guarantee that deadlock will happen when we run code, but it's a situation that can happen. We can make guarantees about the opposite. We can guarantee that deadlock will not happen, but we can't guarantee that it will happen. It's just possible for it to happen. All right, so I want to keep going with this. Last class, I printed out this code. I've, I put this back up on the course webpage under today's uh, lecture. If you have this printout still, great. If you don't have the printout, I, I didn't print any more, but it's on the course webpage. You can find it there. I uploaded my annotated copy of this first page uh, to last class's lecture slot on the course webpage. I want to do a couple of things today. Uh, the first one is I want to quickly look at our list traversal here again. So here we said, I didn't actually write this down, but I'm going to say that this one has a critical section. We didn't say that last time. I didn't mark that down. We said it, but I didn't mark it down. I'm marking it down now. There is a critical section of this code. And then we verbally talked through like what could happen here and what we're looking for when we're trying to say, yes, there's a critical section here. But I'd like to visualize. I would like to visualize this and see like how changing this curve value with concurrent threads of execution is going to result in this unexpected state. After that, we're going to then take a look at uh, this code sample where we're doing something that is more complicated than just traversal of a list, incrementing a value. We're going to do concurrent modifications to a list structure, try to identify if there is a deadlock, uh, is a critical section or not. 
and then what we could do to try and resolve that issue. So let's go back here. Let's go to list traversal B again. This one has a critical section. I'll remind you verbally. This one has a critical section because unlike list traversal A, so that's the other one of these list traversal examples, unlike list traversal A, we've got a shared resource that is then possibly concurrently modified by two separate threads of execution. So that value cur is something that's going to be changed by each of the uh, concurrent executions of this function thread traverse. The list itself is a shared resource. This list is definitely a shared resource up here, but we're not changing it in this code. We're not making changes to this. So because we're not making changes to the list in this code, it's not a, that itself is not part of the critical section. It's purely about that shared resource that we are making concurrent modification to. When we're looking at this, uh, let's visualize what this looks like. And then after that, we can kind of think about, well, maybe where could we put some locks to prevent this from happening in the first place? How do we guarantee mutual exclusion in this critical section so that multiple threads of execution are not able to make concurrent modification to that shared resource? OK, so I'm going to start by drawing a list. I'm not really going to put anything in this list because it doesn't really matter what's in this list. It's just that I have a list. And the very last thing in here is null. This is the end of the list at the bottom. Head right now points at the front of this list. This is the front of my list. I'm going to draw a line down here, and I'm going to label this section shared resources. So these are the things that are common in that shared address space. That's what I'm trying to say. This is in the shared address space between these two, two. We're going to do two threads of execution here. I'm going to write on this side of my page. I'm going to change my color. I'm going to have thread one, and I'm going to have thread two. So I've got two threads of execution. I've, I've created pthread1 and I've created pthread2. Each of these are going to start up, and they're going to start working in this function. The other shared resource that we've got is cur. This is a pointer to a node. I'll draw a box around this, make it look real fancy got a box around cur. And we're going to start stepping through this. And what I want to do is kind of like do what our CPU might be doing here, switch back and forth between these threads of execution as they're running. So if thread one starts, thread one is our first one that's going to get to start in this example. It's going to run line 13. And it's going to cast args to void, and then no effect, no effect. Then thread one is going to set cur to be equal to head. So thread one is blue. Its first task is to set cur equal to head. Then it's going to say branch not equal. So while cur is not equal to null, and then it's going to start executing. So it'll print out cur.value, and then it will say cur is equal to cur.next. So we'll erase our pointer here from head, and then we'll move over to head.next. We go back to the top of the loop. Cur is still not equal to null. And then we kind of get interrupted. So 
Thread 1 was able to run line 13, line 14, 15 to 17, 15 to 19. It was able to run these lines of code. And then it gets to line 14 again, and it is interrupted. So another thread of execution is going to start taking over now. Thread 2 is going to start taking over. Thread 2 is going to enter this function thread traverse. Thread 2 is going to enter the function thread traverse. It's going to run line 13. It's going to set args void cast to void. I'm not using this thing, so no op. It's going to set cur is equal to head. It's going to run line 14. So it's going to set this shared resource cur is equal to head. And then it gets interrupted. Then it gets interrupted. And then thread one takes over again. Thread one has, uh, whoops, I should write line 15 here. Forgive me. Thread one has run line 15 again. It's tested to see is this thing equal to null or not. And it's entered the loop, but it hasn't done anything inside the loop yet. But the value of cur is now the head again. So it's, it will print out the head. And then it's going to set cur is equal to cur.next. So we're going to run through line 15 to 19 again. It will set cur is equal to the next node in the list. And then it gets interrupted. And we switch. And now thread 2 is going to start running line 15. And line 15 is testing, is cur equal to null? It's not equal to null yet. OK, so that's great. We'll run line 15 in thread 2. And then it immediately gets interrupted. This is super contrived. Don't, don't get me wrong. Like I'm making this happen. I'm making this happen. I'm forcing this to happen. But it's possible for this to happen. It is possible for this to happen. OK. So thread 2 is interrupted at line 15. It succeeds. It gets past this. The instruction pointer says, now you're here next. You're going to start doing the printf. Thread 1 takes over again. And thread 1, we're going to say that thread 1 is able to make it all the way through this list. It is able to make it completely through the list and print everything out before it's interrupted again. So thread 1 is going to print out that node and then set it to next. It's going to print out that node and set it to next. And it's going to print out that node and set it to next. And now cur is null. Cur is null finishes. We exit the loop. We exit the function. And now thread 2 gets to go again. It finished running line 15. It completely finished it. So it's not going to test again as cur equal to null. It won't test that. It's just going to start trying to print out curve.value, cur.value. So it's going to try to run line 17. And what's going to happen with line 17 is, Sig fault, segmentation fault. I always forget if there's a period at the end of it or not, but I'm going to put a period here just for finality. There's a seg fault. We're going to get a segmentation fault. It's going to crash. We've got two separate threads of execution that are accessing a shared resource, and they are concurrently modifying that shared resource. If it was just read, if it was only read, no critical section. We're not making changes to it anymore. But because we're making changes to that shared resource, we can have a critical section. The good makes sense. Good, good. OK. Now the question is, how, how do we fix this? How do we protect this so that we're not going to have concurrent modification to this shared resource that we've got. I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to put some time on my timer here. I want you to take the time to think about this. 
what part of this code is doing the concurrent modification. The expected output, the expected output is that we get the list printed twice. That's the expected output, but we don't care or know what the order is. Maybe we do want to know what the order is. Maybe we do want to predict what the order of output is, but we don't care. That's not the expected output right now. The expected output is just print that value twice. Print that, all the values in the list twice. Where would we put the locks? Where would we declare the lock? And where would we try to acquire and release the locks? I'm going to give you like one minute. I'm just putting one minute on my timer. And I am not going to ask for feedback. I'll just barf it out at you. And then you can kind of confirm mentally if you've got the right idea here, OK? So that's a good question. That's a really, really good question. Are we trying to have it print the whole list, or does it matter if it goes back and forth? That's your question? OK, good. It doesn't matter. Now, I want you to think, no, this is like usability as opposed to uh, correctness of output. Do you want, as a dev, to see one thread print out the whole list and then the next thread print out the whole list, or is it OK to see them interleaved? I, I think probably. The first one is the more preferred one, but uh, I got one minute on my timer. So please, please go ahead and think about it. I think it's going to be easier to, for you to think about it if it is just print the whole list and then print the whole list. OK, so I'm, I'm going to erase some stuff here. The PDF that I uploaded yesterday has some of the stuff that I'm erasing. So just, just be aware that the one I'm going to upload, I, I will upload this today, but it's going to have stuff erased. And you, you'll have to like go back and forth between PDFs. But it's there. It's up there. So I'm going to erase this stuff, the concurrent modification and shared resource stuff. We've got a few options. We saw last time when we were doing the counter that if we declare and initialize a lock in thread traverse in the function itself, we might as well not have a lock. It's, it's local to that thread. Every thread gets its own copy of the lock, and it's useless. So we don't want that. The choices that we have that remain for where do we declare and initialize the lock are, I can declare it outside the function outside the function. I could also, I could also declare it outside the function, but inside the struct. I could give the ability for a, a node itself, an individual node in the list to be locked. I could do that. In this case, in this specific case, that doesn't make sense. So I'm going to use keywords here. This, putting it out here, is basically saying, I'm going to have a lock that is global. Every thread of execution has access to this lock, and it applies to the, to the file. If I put the lock here, this is what I would call a coarse-grained lock. This is a coarse-grained lock. There's one lock for the whole file, for the entire file. You might have a bunch of coarse-grained locks that do different things, but because it's file scope, I would call this a coarse-grained lock. If I put it up here, 
inside the node structure, so inside an individual node in the list, so every node gets its own lock, excuse me, I would call this a fine-grained lock. These are overloaded terms now. I, I realize that these are overloaded terms. Coarse grain concurrency processes, fine grain concurrency threads, coarse grained locks, file scope, fine grained locks within an individual part of an overall structure. In this case, we've got uh, kind of, this is more of a spectrum than just like a binary is coarse grained or fine grained because we could also do things like have a list struct and be able to just lock the list itself. Because we have just one list, we've got node pointer head, there's only one list in this file, it kind of makes sense to me to have just one lock. So I would put the pthread uh, lock here, pthread mutex t. I'm just going to write the word mutex. mutex lock. I'm going to put it there. That's where I would put this lock. What I'm trying to protect, what's part of my critical section here, is this variable cur. This is my crit part of my critical section. I'm trying to protect that, so it kind of makes sense for my lock to be at the same scope as the thing that I'm trying to protect. Now, where do I acquire and release the locks? There is two places, I think, where acquiring and releasing makes sense. One of them is acquire it here before the loop, immediately before I start the loop, and then release after I finish the loop. The other is just before I make a change to cur and just after I make a change to cur. I'm going to scroll up. I'm going to scroll up. In this example here, where we had counter plus plus, and we could put the lock there. We could definitely put the lock inside the loop, and it was correct, but it performed terribly. It was very inefficient because we're just lock on lock, lock on lock, lock on lock, lock on lock, 200 million times. It was OK to put it there because it was technically correct, because this is a in non-atomic instruction, a non-atomic statement. It's a non-atomic statement. We compile plus plus down increment. It becomes three separate instructions. So it kind of made sense to lock that. Down here in my list traversal, cur equals cur next. That kind of that kind of is an atomic operation. That's basically just a store. That's basically just a store. And if we think about it, this is an exercise for the reader. If you think about it, locking that modification doesn't change the fact that we can test if cur is null and then still be interrupted after we've tested it, and then somebody else can still make changes to it. If I test for null here and then I get interrupted, somebody else can go through the whole list, lock, release, lock, release, lock, release, lock, release, set it to null, and then I can start the loop, and it's still going to get me back into that state of seg fault, this is null, it doesn't work anymore. The best place to acquire the lock is here, just outside the loop, and that gives us the side effect of thread one will print the whole list, and then thread two will print the whole list. We'll get through the entire list before uh, we're allowing something else to uh, get access to that. Uh, yeah, you're, you're actually right. Thank you for saying that. Shouldn't lock go before cur is equal to head? Yes. This is our first modification to that thing, that shared resource. So let's lock it before we even get to that point. Thank you for that. Lock. And I'm just going to use pseudocode here. Uh, lock, lock, oh gosh, lock, 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 and then unlock. This 
This is a contrived example. This is a contrived example. A better solution for this specific situation would just be to use a stack variable instead of using locks and stuff anyway. Just use a stack variable instead of locks and stuff. If you want to print in order, then you may still want to put a lock on this. You may still want to put a lock on before you start printing, lock, lock. And then any other thread that tries to enter will be prohibited from entering and starting to print until after you've finished printing. And that's kind of like locking standard output, locking what I'm printing to. This is a contrived example, but it gives us an opportunity to think about things like fine-grained versus coarse-grained locking uh, and where to, put, where to put lock acquisition and stuff. OK, any questions about this? Yeah. So if we lock before we do the loop and then unlock after, doesn't that defeat the purpose of doing things in a multi-threaded way? You might as well just call the function twice, right? Yes, absolutely. And that's kind of the same as that counter example. It's, this is contrived. Like, it makes more sense to just count to, to 200 million in one thread doing the loop twice than it does to have two threads independently doing it. But this is a small enough example for us to see these issues. You're right. It would be better to just call this twice. It would be better to just call this twice. And putting the locks outside the loop turns that into a serial operation. Finish one completely first, and then finish the next one completely second. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a place where it seems reasonable to put a lock, yes. Yeah, it, it, I, I, think, I think you are. And if my answer doesn't answer your question, let me know. But if we did put the locks here, like I could lock this, but somebody else could still print something out. And then I could be changing this and then unlocking. And then the second thread, so if we have the lock right here, we've got two threads of execution. Thread one gets to the lock statement, and it acquires the lock. And then it's interrupted before it's able to change anything. If thread two tries to acquire the lock, it will block. It gets stuck there. It's not allowed to enter until thread one has released the lock. So the change to the value here of cur to be cur.next will be only done within the one but then it may immediately be done by the second one. So we could lock it, thread one locks it, it, it acquires the lock, it changes the value, it unlocks it, and then it's interrupted. Thread two then is allowed to proceed and change the value of cur. Yeah, so we're kind of still wind up in kind of a weird state where we're skipping nodes at that point, if both of them are allowed to, to skip through something. Yeah. Yeah. So line three is not really better because it's only going to allow us to lock an individual node. That's not what we're trying to lock here with cur. Cur is a pointer to a node, but it's not actually a node itself. If I wanted to guarantee that I've got two threads of execution and I'm changing the value of this node, so let's say these are all integers and I want to be able to increment an individual node, I may want to be able to say, I want you to lock just this node to do increment. And then that means that other threads could increment other nodes in my list while this one is being changed because they're not locked out of that. But because cur is this one individual shared resource, it doesn't make sense to put it in the struct itself.
So if we put the lock on line three, then every individual node would have its own lock. And that, that's a good situation when we want to have many threads making changes to individual nodes in the list. So I want to be able to lock just this one node and allow other threads of execution to modify the other nodes in the list concurrently. If I just have this file scope one like I have right now, and I want to modify individual nodes in the list, then that's going to say no other threads are allowed to make changes to any nodes in the list. The whole list is locked. Nobody else is allowed to make changes. They're allowed to do other stuff, but they wouldn't be allowed to make changes to the list. So it, it really depends on what we're trying to protect. And in this case, what we're really trying to protect is this pointer to a node cur, so that we don't have multiple threads making changes to that specific value. We don't actually care about the contents of the list with this example. I'm actually going to leave that to be answered by the next example. OK? OK. All right. I'm going to move on to the next example here. I asked you to read this. I asked you to read this uh, before class. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to remind yourself about what this is, because we were just talking about something completely different. So take 30 seconds to remind yourself about what this is. And then I really hope that you all brought your lumpy space princesses back. The first question that we're trying to answer here is, does this contain a critical section or not? OK. If you've got your lumpy space princess still, this means angry space princess means there is a critical section in this code. Happy space princess means there is no critical section in this code. What do you think? And if you don't have a space princess, I don't know, frown or something. <laughs> OK, there is a critical section in this code. There is a critical section in this code. I'm going to add some context to this. Thread insert after is a function that we may call concurrently. We may have two threads of execution that are trying to run this code at the same time. We've got a list. It's a global state thing. We have one list for this entire file. So this is shared across all of the, the threads of execution that we have running. We've got a node. The node structure is a list of strings. And we're passing to this uh, function, this threaded function, an instance of this struct. So when I called uh, pthread create, instead of putting null in the last argument, I'm putting a pointer to one of those structures. I'm putting a pointer to one of those structures. Insert after here is going to be a pointer to a node that's somewhere in this list. To insert is a node that I've just created. I've just created it. It's not in the list anywhere yet. On lines 20 and uh, 21 here, these two lines, this is like it's an insert. I take next.next .next and I change that to be new nodes next, and then I say this one's next is the new node. I'm going to give you five more seconds to think about this. Are there two threads of execution? If I run this with two threads of execution, what are the conditions necessary? So I've said, yes, there is a critical section in this code. What are the conditions that are necessary for two threads of execution to run into this critical section? Just take 10 seconds. 
While you're thinking about that, I am going to start drawing out a list. I'm going to start drawing out a list. All right. So here's my list. I've got two threads of execution. The conditions necessary. So when I'm thinking about conditions here, the conditions necessary are what values are being passed into these. That's the, that's the first part of the condition. The second condition is where do we get interrupted that causes this problem? The first condition is that thread one, we're going to call thread one, and it's going to have two inserts. It's going to have, I'm going to write just after and uh, after. So this is, I'll write insert after. Insert after and two inserts. So insert after is a node that's already in the list. To insert is the new node that I want to insert. Thread two has the same thing. It was past this struct, insert after. To insert. The first condition is thread one is going to insert after the head of my list. Thread two is going to insert after the head of my list. They're both going to try to insert after the head of my list. The second half of the condition is we've got lines 21 and 22. These are basically the only lines that, that do anything in this function. The first one is just like, Let's get the struct into a struct state so that I can use it. What's the interruption? At what point can a thread of execution be interrupted where we're going to get into a state where we've got an inconsistent data structure? So let's start this. Thread one gets to go first. Thread one is going to do this line first. It's going to say to insert next is equal to insert operation insert after next. To insert here is a new node. This is my new node for thread one. And it says to insert next is equal to insert after next. So it says this. The next of this node is the second node in the list. We're good. We got that. Good. Good. And then it gets interrupted. Now thread two starts to get to run. Thread two says insert to insert next is equal to insert after next. So here is thread two's new node. It does the same thing. It does exactly the same thing. It's going to take heads next, and it's going to say that it's this one's next. These are arrows all over the place. It's going to set that next. But it doesn't get interrupted. It gets to run the next statement. And it says insert after next is equal to insert operation to insert. So I'm going to erase what heads next is right now 
and I'm going to change it to be this new node in my list. We've got kind of a circle now, but it's still a list, but we've got this new node inserted into it. Good, great, excellent. Thread 2 finishes. There's nothing left in this function to do. Thread 1 returns. Thread 1 now is going to get to run this next statement. Thread 1 is going to get to run this next statement that says, I would like to change insert afters next to be to insert. And so we say, I'm going to take the next of the head node here. I'm going to erase whatever its next currently is. And I'm going to change it to be this node. And this is a slightly more linear list. It's a less bulbous circle. But now we've kind of got this inconsistent list. Nobody is pointing at this anymore. Nobody's pointing at this anymore. It's just like hanging out there in space. It's pointing at that node, but as far as like traversing this list again, we can't, we can't see that node anymore. We can't get there. There's a technical term for this. I'm trying to remember what it is when we're talking about graphs and stuff, and we've got a node that's unreachable. It's an unreachable node. That's the technical term I want to think of. This is an unreachable node from what we know about when we're starting this. We've got a pointer to head. We can traverse the list, but we'll never be able to reach this node because the list doesn't actually point at it anymore. This isn't going to happen every time. Like 99% of the time, our threads are just going to run each of their functions correctly. And it will be fine, except that one time out of 100 where we get into this state where a thread is interrupted and it's not able to complete what we want it to be able to complete. OK, so this is our critical section. These are the conditions necessary for this critical section to show up. Our next thing to want to be able to do is to decide where do we declare the lock, and where do we acquire the lock, and where do we release the lock. I'm going to give you time to think about this again. Take, take one minute, 30 seconds to think about this. Where do we declare it? Where do we acquire it? Where do we release it? And remember that where do we declare the lock can also be inside an object. It can be inside a struct. We're, we're not forbidden from having locks inside of a struct. We can do that. We could put them in there. Or we could put them outside entirely. So take one minute, 30 seconds. And again, I'll, I'll barf this back out at you. And you can kind of mentally confirm if what you were thinking is what I've got going on in my head, too. All right. OK, so you've got an idea in your head where we're going to declare it. I've highlighted a few lines on here, line 3, line 9, line 15. 
I'm, I'm just going to definitively say nowhere between line 16 and 24 does it make sense for us to declare the lock. It doesn't make sense for us to declare it or initialize it there. So we've got three places. We don't have 15 fingers, so I can't do that. Uh, I'll just do one, two, three. I want you to vote on this right now. I want you to tell me informally what you think about this. If you think it's line three, show one finger. This is really confusing already. If you think it's line nine, show two fingers. If you think it's line 15, show three fingers. Please go ahead. No stakes, just show me what you think. I can't, I, is, is that four fingers or is that two options? Okay, it's two options, okay. Okay, so lots of one, so lots of line three. I think we should put it on line three. And then a couple of, we should put it on line 15. Those are both correct. Those are both technically correct places for us to want to put the lock. Those are technically correct places. In terms of efficiency, one of those is better than the other. So if we declare the lock here, if I declare the lock right here, I'm going to change my color to be a darker color. If I put the lock here, the thing that we're going to be locking is the entire list. That's what we're locking. If I put it in that file scope spot, I'm locking the entire list. That would be fine. That would actually be fine. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say on your behalf that you're going to acquire and release here. There aren't really a lot of options. There's not a lot of options here. There's not a lot of options, so I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, we're acquiring here and we're releasing here. If we lock the head of this list, we are going to say that nobody is allowed to insert anywhere in this list until I finish doing my insert operation. So if thread one starts and thread two starts and they are both trying to insert, thread one has to finish. And this is fast. It's fast. Like, it's not a big deal. It's fast. It won't take long for it to finish. But thread one has to finish before thread two is even allowed to start trying to insert something. If I have 500 threads and a billion nodes, thread one has to finish before any other threads are allowed to make changes to the list then thread two has to finish, or some thread has to finish before any other threads are allowed to make changes to the list. Even if we're in a state where I want to say insert after head and insert after tail, where there's no collision, there's no issue with concurrent modification of the same parts of the list. And this is technically correct. It's going to give us a consistent list every single time but it's inefficient. We're not going to allow many threads of executions to make changes to things that are in different parts of the list that are completely separate from each other. The other option is to put the lock inside each node that we're going to try to make changes to. And the acquisition of lock here is I want to lock one of the nodes that I'm trying to insert after. Uh, insert after. It's the lock that we're trying to acquire the lock in the node that we're trying to insert after. To insert is like a, a thread local thing. This is unique per each thread of execution. This is the thing that's actually in the list already. So I want to acquire a lock on this one so that I can get its next and then change its next as a single atomic operation. Both of these statements will happen before somebody else is allowed to make changes to that. But the difference is, I'm putting a lock on this, this node. If two threads want to make changes to this node, then only one will be allowed to go first, and then the next one will be allowed to go. If I've got two threads that are trying to make changes to two completely separate nodes, they can happen concurrently. And it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference because they're not related to each other. On the node insert, on this one here, if we put the lock here, this is kind of a thread local 
object. It's an instance of a thread local object. It's created for that specific thread. No other thread is going to have that. So it's effectively the same as a stack variable in that case. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to put that there. So this is technically correct. This is technically correct. This is more efficient. because it doesn't lock the whole list. It just locks one node that we're making changes to. We're good? We OK? Yeah. Yeah, so would the, would the acquire and release stay at the same place? Yes, they would. Uh, the difference is what you're acquiring and what you're releasing. So if you're doing this with line 15 where you're locking the entire list, you'd be locking this lock that's on the entire list. If you're doing this approach, you'd be locking the insert after uh, lock. So the lock that belongs to that specific node. Any other questions? Good. OK, good, good. This is the end of critical sections for us in terms of identify and then uh, put locks on it to prevent concurrent modification to a shared resource. This is the end of that discussion. So I'm going to talk now briefly about term test one. The content for term test one, it's in class on Thursday next week. The content is up to and including process scheduling. So that's the first topic for next week. We will not be doing IO or disk scheduling or disks at all on this term test. That will be on the final exam. There's not going to be any C programming questions. You're being adequately assessed on C programming in the labs and the assignments. I don't want to print out a thousand manual pages because I'd, I would give you the manual pages if I was expecting to you to write code in C. I don't care about whether or not you've memorized the specific order of arguments to exec VP. I, I don't care about that. You may have to write pseudocode though. So like. What, I'm, what I mean by that is write code that maybe kind of looks like C, but the order of arguments doesn't really matter. The values that you put into it matters to a certain point, but not like I'm going to be, hey, there is no null terminator in this, and like that's bad. That, I, I don't really care about that. I'm way, way more interested in show me that you understand and show me that you can flow through what you're supposed to do. Give me an idea of what that flow looks like. Give me an idea that kind of demonstrates that you've got an idea of how things are changing in the structures that the operating system has for processes and threads. I don't care if you know the API for pthread create, but you should know that to create a thread, you should probably wait for that thread to finish when you're done your program. That's, that's the kind of idea that I'm looking for here with pseudocode. You're going to be expected to read C code. I will print out some C code, and I will ask you questions about the C code. So there will be code that is C in the test that you'll, that you'll be expected to read and then answer questions about it. But I'm not going to expect you to write that same code. And the last thing that I want to say is uh, seating will be assigned for this test. So it's in this classroom. I'm going to send you an email on Wednesday that says what seat number you're supposed to sit in. Uh, the papers that will be put out on the desks will have your names printed on them already. Uh, so you'll have to sit at the place where you're told to sit, because otherwise you're writing somebody else's test. If you've made alternative accommodations for where you are writing the test, that will be you will be provided with the correct test. That test will show up in the place you need to be if you've done that. If you're coming to the classroom, you have to sit in the spot uh, that you're expected to sit. I'll also make sure to put like a map of the room with approximate seat numbers per row. I'll put that up on the screen as you're coming in, and I'll put it up on the course web page so you have a sense of where to sit before you show up in the classroom. So it's not just a mad scramble looking for uh, paper numbers. 
Although paper number one will be at the front and paper number 60 will be closer to the back. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions about the tests other than what I have said here? Yeah. It's a good question. What, what would I recommend that you do to prepare? All of the, the way that I write tests, the way that I create tests is to look at the learning outcomes that I have been telling you that you should be able to do by the end of each class. And I'm not always like super good at making sure that we actually get to all those learning outcomes in a class, but those are the things that I am talking about in the classroom. Those are the things that I'm looking at in the textbook. Those are the things that I'm asking you to do in the room as activities. When I write tests, I am like putting those learning outcomes on the paper. You will see them. I printed them. I will have pr had them printed on the paper attached to the question that I'm asking you to, to answer. So in that sense, look at the learning outcomes. If you haven't been looking at the learning outcomes, look at the learning outcomes and get a sense of what those are. Think about the exercises that we have been doing in class. Think about the exercises we've been doing in class and try to make sure that you can do those things in an environment that is, here's some code, is this condition met for, for this specific thing? Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? How long will the test last? It will be 75 minutes, so it's the, the length of a class. I haven't finished setting the test yet, so no, I don't know. Uh, but it, what, what you should look for in the learning outcomes, so related to the question that was over here, what you should look for in the learning outcomes, I, I, I'm not asking you to write C code, so it's not likely that I'm going to be asking you to use the pthreads library. Um, but you know, look at the learning outcomes that haven't been assessed in other places already. Look at the learning outcomes that haven't been assessed in other places to get a sense of what learning outcomes might be on this test. Uh, I don't usually like to give out previous tests not because I don't want them to be compromised, but I don't want to give you a false sense of what's going to be on the test. If I give you somebody else's test that has a bunch of multiple choice questions and you're feeling really confident about answering those multiple choice questions, and then you show up and there's no multiple choice questions, that's, that, that would feel terrible. That would feel really, really bad. And it would, I feel like it would be kind of disingenuous of me to do something like that. So I, I don't really like to do that. Any other questions? OK. I, I know that you have an assignment looming over you right now, and it's hard to think about the term test that's like, this is a steam locomotive. It is moving now. Uh, I know it's hard to think about it. I am going to make a point of scheduling in on, um, let's say, on Tuesday next week. Another, I'm just going to like block off five minutes. This is time to ask questions about it. Uh, that will give you, I, you know, I'm going to change my mind about that. I'm going to block off 10 to 15 minutes. That will give you time to catch up on the readings if you haven't been keeping up with them. Uh, and I'm going to set 10 to 15 minutes to be like questions about course content, questions about textbook, questions about exam, questions about everything. Um, in terms of next week, uh, the other thing that you're doing is the lab. And uh, the lab, I'm going to straight up say it, is significantly easier than the last lab was. It is significantly easier, uh, particularly the first part where you are implementing locks. Uh, we're talking about changing an existing C file with just a few lines of code. It's, it's not a huge thing. It is not not a huge thing. The condition variables part is like a little bit bigger, but it is like less than 50 lines of code. It's not, it is not a lot. So the this was intentionally done when term test one and lab two are colliding with each other so that lab two is not as onerous. Please don't just ignore it until Friday. At least open it and take a look to get a sense of what you're being expected to do. But it, I'm hoping to like calm a little bit of nerves if there's anxiety about uh, what's going on next week.
OK, all right, good. Uh, like I said, I'm going to put 10 to 15 minutes on. I'm going to send, I'm going to do like the oldest person thing I know how to do, and I'm going to send myself an email from my personal Gmail account to my work account to say, make sure you put 10 to 15 minutes in the schedule on, make sure you put, and I'm writing this out, I'm actually writing out, make sure you put 10 to 15 minutes, minutes at the beginning of the lecture on Tuesday for questions. Okay. Thank you for that email, Franklin, says future me. Let's, uh, let's take a look at deadlock. We've just spent a lecture and a half talking about, hey, we've got these critical sections. We've got multiple threads of execution that are tr possibly trying to concurrently modify a shared resource. And we solved that problem by talking a lot about where do we put locks? Where do we put locks in this code to prevent multiple threads of execution from entering a critical section in the first place? We're trying to set up mutual exclusion, mutual exclusion. I want to make sure that only one thread of execution will ever be running this at a given time. I want to guarantee that mutual exclusion. One or none are in this right now. One or none are in this right now. By putting lock acquisition here and releasing it here, I can now guarantee that only one thread of execution will ever enter this critical section at a time. Others will get stuck and they will wait and then they will eventually get access to it, but they're going to get stuck there. Locks are a tool that we can use to synchronize across multiple threads of execution, which is great, but then we can get ourselves into other problems. The main other problem that we like to think about academically, and this is academically now, the main other problem that we like to think about academically is deadlock. If I'm remembering the textbook correctly, it says something like 97% of concurrency bugs are other stuff, and then like 3% are deadlock. But this is the most interesting one, because all the other ones are, I've got multiple threads and I forgot to put a lock on it. Deadlock is a situation where we have two or more concurrent threads of execution, two or more, where we've got certain conditions that must be held, and deadlock can happen. Again, we cannot guarantee deadlock will happen. It just can happen. Deadlock can happen when all four of these conditions hold. I'm going to list them quickly, and then I'm going to step through each one a little bit more slowly. Mutual exclusion, which is a word I just used, hold and wait. No preemption. Preemption is a word that throws back to last week when we're talking about a threat of execution or a process getting kicked off of the processor. It's being preempted. And we will also see this again next week when we talk about scheduling in terms of processes getting kicked off and then somebody else getting access to the CPU. But here we're going to use no preemption in a specific uh, way. And then circular wait. Mutual exclusion is reds claim exclusive control of resources they require. So for example, a thread grabs a lock. I use this picture kind of on purpose. It's a, bath it's a bathroom. This is a bathroom. When somebody goes into the bathroom stall, they lock the door, and then nobody else can come in, especially if they're the doors that go from ceiling to floor, like top to bottom. Nobody else is getting into this room. When I go in there, I lock the door. Nobody else can come in. It's mutually exclusive. I have claimed access to that resource. Nobody else is allowed to have access to that resource when I've got it. Hold and wait is threads hold the resources that are allocated to them. So you've acquired a lock. Once you have it, you hold it 
even if somebody else wants it. And if you then get stuck waiting for another resource, you just still hold on to it. You don't give it up. You never try to give it up. So if I've got two things that I want to hold in my hands, I've got a pen and a phone, and I'm going to give you my pen because I don't feel comfortable giving you my phone. I've got this, you've got that, and I look and I say, oh, you've got the pen, I guess I'll just wait. You still got that pen, I guess I'll just wait. But I'm still holding on to my phone. I'm still holding on to this thing. I'm not going to give it up. No preemption means once you've got it, nobody externally can take it from you. So we've got threads of execution. They acquire a lock. Got a lock declared in my function or in my uh, file. A thread has acquired the lock. Pthread mutex lock. It's got the lock. I'm holding on to it. My operating system cannot come and just say, oh, you've been waiting on this lock for a long time. Yoink. It can't do that. And I, I think about this for a second. If you're stuck waiting for a lock and somebody could say, okay, well, you actually can't have that lock. What would that mean? Okay, proceed anyway. And then crash. Or crash, just crash. You've been holding on to this for a really long time. I'm going to kill you. You're done. Once you've got the lock, nobody externally can take it away from you. You could give it up, but if we're holding and waiting, you're not going to give it up and nobody can take it from you. Nobody's going to be able to come and take this thing away from you. Circular weight is we've got two or more threads that are each in these states holding and waiting, nobody else can take it from me, and I'm the only one that holds it, but we're waiting for each other. So you've got, you've got my pen, you want my phone, I've got my phone, you want my pen, and we're just kind of stalemate. I'm not giving this to you. You give that to me, no. I've got this, you give that to me, no. And we're just kind of stuck. In practice, what this looks like is we've got two lines of code, pthread mutex lock, lock one, pthread mutex lock, lock two. One thread locks lock one, the other thread locks lock two, and then we try to do the opposite. Now I'm trying to lock lock one and you're trying to lock lock two, but we're both just stuck waiting. We're blocked on those pthread mutex lock statements and we're just stuck. We're never going to get out of this. I handed out some code. If you want a physical copy of this code, uh, feel free to grab it if you didn't get one. These are also up on the course webpage. Sorry that it's printed out on several pages, but I'm going to uh, pop this up on the screen. And what I want us to do is uh, kind of step through this together. The first thing that I want us to do is, is try to just make this decision about what the code actually, what it actually does. So I'm going to, I guess I have to close this and then reopen it. Rotate. Full screen. Okay, so here's the first page, and all I'm going to say is that we've got two structs that are being declared. One is a bank account. It has a balance. That's it. It's an int. It can be negative. You can go into debt. It has a lock. It has a lock on the balance itself. The second struct here is uh, arguments that are going to be passed to threads of execution to conduct a transfer. I want to take money from the from account. I want to deposit it into the to account. And this is how much I want to transfer between those two things. 
This is a structure that I'm going to pass to threads. I'm going to create threads of execution that will try to concurrently do transfers between accounts. My function here, I'm going to just completely gloss over. This is here for completeness purposes. Create an account. So initialize the lock, have an initial amount in my account, and that's it. Just dynamically allocate this thing and don't do anything with it. Deposit, this is the important function. This is the one we're going to spend a lot of time looking at, so I'm going to skip over it. And I'm going to look at the main function and this other create transfer function. Create transfer, similar to create account, is just creating it. It's initializing this object that we want to create, which is that transfer object. In the main function, I'm creating two threads of execution, thread one and thread two. I'm initializing the bank accounts to each have a thousand in them, a thousand dollars, cents, units of money, whatever. I'm creating transfers between these two accounts. So I'm transferring from account one to account two, 100 units. I'm transferring from account two to account one, 100 units. So net sum, it's the same value in both accounts. It should be the same value in both accounts at the end of execution. Then I create two threads of execution here. One is supposed to conduct transfer one, one is supposed to conduct transfer two. I wait for these threads to finish, and then I release all the resources that I've acquired in the first part of this. So all the accounts that I created, all of that's released. Here's our deposit function. We're going to be able to just finish looking at this code today. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up on uh, Tuesday next week. I'm sorry that the delay is so long. It's like normally we're seeing each other tomorrow, but now it's going to be several days. It will be several, several days. And we're all delighted, I think. I think we're probably all delighted. Yeah, yeah. OK, so in deposit, uh, Void pointer. So one thing that we can take a note of with this code is that we can see how uh, values are being passed to this function. So when I create pthread, I'm passing um, the transfer object. And then when I'm actually in the function, I have to cast it back out of the arg argument that's been passed to me. So this is just that void pointer that's being passed to the function. Going through the process of doing the transfer is I have to acquire a lock on the thing that I'm taking stuff out of first. That's the choice that I've made here. I've got an account that I'm taking money from, and I've got an account that I'm going to put money into. The decision is I want to check to see if the account that I'm taking money from has enough money to do the transfer before I actually do anything else. I want to make sure that when I'm testing what the balance is for this from account, that it's not going to change. So args amount here and args from balance, I want to make sure that this account's balance does not change while I am testing to see if there's enough money in it. So I'm locking that account's balance. Nobody else is going to be allowed to make changes to this account's balance while I'm saying, hey, is there enough money in this account? If there was enough money, so let's look at the opposite case. If there was enough money here, and then I get interrupted here, and somebody else takes money out of the account, then I'm going to be in a state where I've gone into overdraft, and I don't want to go into overdraft. I don't want to get to negative money. So I want to lock the account's balance before I even test to see if there's enough money in it. If there isn't enough, then I unlock it and I bail out. I just return immediately. There's no point in even trying to do this transfer because there's not enough money in this account. If there is enough money, then I'm going to lock two's balance. I want the transfer operation from from to 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 be atomic. 
I want this to happen like as an entire operation here. Minus equals, plus equals, decrement and increment. So this is like load sub store, load add store. These are six instructions now that we've got for these two statements. I do not want to be interrupted in the middle of those. I want them to complete before anybody else is allowed to make changes to these different accounts. Once I finish doing this, then I'm going to unlock my two locks on those balances, and then somebody else will be allowed to start making changes to the accounts. Okay. We're going to come back to this function. We're going to come back to this function, and we're going to be coming back to this function, and we're going to be paying attention to these two lines here when we come back to this function. If you've got this printout and you want to use it next class, please bring it back on Tuesday. Uh, if you don't have it and you want it, I still have some up here. If you don't want it and you don't have it, then don't get it. Good. So I'm going to uh, quickly summarize here. Multi-threaded code can have data races in critical sections. And we're using locks and mutual exclusion to resolve those data races so that we don't have multiple threads of execution entering these critical sections in the first place. Locks can introduce new issues, specifically like deadlock, specifically like deadlock. And we're going to look at this code and we're going to be thinking about how it can enter a deadlock state. Thank you all for coming out. I hope that you have a great long weekend, and I will see you all on Tuesday.